Hi there, I'm Mike, and what I have for you today is a twofer of a review. It's the first review of a brand new year, so I figured I'd give you something a little bit special. I feel like it's high time to bring you the Beskar Mandalorian. Now, in 2020, Hasbro essentially released this figure twice, once in the main line, and then once with some upgrades and some extra accessories. So let's go over both releases, and I feel like maybe you could choose which one's best for you and why it's the Target exclusive one with all the extra stuff. If you haven't seen my original Mandalorian review, I do recommend watching that. A lot of these things are the same. It's essentially the same figure. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started by reading the bio on the back of the box while you look at pictures of him on your screen. His body is shielded by Beskar armor. His face is hidden behind a T-visored mask. And his past is wrapped in mystery. No one's quite sure who this well-equipped stranger is. That's a very generic bio for someone who hasn't seen any episodes of The Mandalorian. Next, let's read the one from the Target exclusive version. The Mandalorian is battle-worn and tight-lipped, a formidable bounty hunter in an increasingly dangerous galaxy who finds a mysterious alien pursued by bounty hunters on behalf of Imperial interests. That essentially sums up the first episode or three of the very first season. So no spoilers there. Now, if you haven't seen the second season of The Mandalorian, I'm going to try not to spoil it too much. But if you haven't seen it by now, just go watch it. It's on you at this point. So as always, we'll start off the review by talking about the character a little bit as a character. The Mandalorian is named Din Djarin. I don't really feel like that's that much of a spoiler if you haven't seen the first season of the show. It's actually just on the box for this one, it just says it. He was a foundling brought into the Mandalorian fold by members of a weird cult that never takes off their helmets. We've learned more about that now, I suppose. The Mandalorian is played somewhat by Pedro Pascal. There are a couple places in the series where his helmet is off and we see the actor's face, but mostly he does the voice work. Most of the time under the armor is actually the grandson of John Wayne, Brandon Wayne. That's just a fun fact. He's the titular character of the show and his popularity is basically at an all-time high. So let's talk about the looks of the character here. Does what we get in hand in a six inch scale match what we get on the screen? And the answer unequivocally is kind of. Yes, but no. Uh, yes, in the sense that the silhouette is right. He's got his armor, he's got his helmet, uh, he's got his pants. Like, he, yeah, he looks like the Mandalorian does on the screen. The problem is when you get down into the actual detail, Beskar armor is very shiny. It's lustrous, it's resplendent. We don't really get that here represented in the figure. Yes, it's silver, it's clearly colored to be silver, but it's not shiny enough. And that's actually been a problem in the Black Series for a while. C-3PO, Captain Phasma, all these figures are meant to be shiny, like chrome shiny, and they never are. It should be shinier. But because of the changes made this year, there's one other aspect to the looks here that I do have to talk about. And it's something that I couldn't talk about in the last figure review, and that is the removable helmet and the character actor likeness. So here we have essentially Pedro Pascal, but not really. So sometimes Hasbro, less is more. While I appreciate the attempt to give us an unmasked Mandalorian, does this look like Pedro Pascal? And the answer is not, not, not really, no, not not so much. I mean, it doesn't not look like him. I can see it, but it's not great. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know what picture they were using. He's simultaneously too chubby and too thin. I don't really know how that works. He has this weird worried expression on his face. Seriously, what picture did they use to take a look at this? But with the helmet on, it's really not that bad. Speaking of removable helmet, Let's take a look at his other accessories. Now, this is another point where if you've seen my original Mandalorian review, most of these accessories also came with the original release. So we're talking the IB-94 blaster. It's a little shinier and silverier, arguably more shinier and silverier 
than his armor is. It fits well in his hand. It mostly fits in the holster, but I do have a hard time closing the holster when the blaster is in there. Alternatively, he also does have his standard Ambin Phase Pulse blaster rifle. This was made popular by Boba Fett in the holiday special, but now I would say arguably it's more the Mandalorians here. This is Din's gun. He's used it far longer and more often to us. So those are the two accessories that we're used to. If you want to know more about them, their details and stuff like that, you can go check out my original review. Although I will say the paint on the Ambin Blaster is better than on the original. Also, another accessory that I'm counting as an accessory this time is his hard molded plastic cloak. It is removable, it just pulls right over his head. It's something I didn't really do that much with the old one, but it is something you will do with this one because of the next accessory we'll talk about. And that is his jetpack. Now the jetpack fits into two holes onto his back. It is essential for the season two Mandalorian to have because once he got it at the end of season one of the Mandalorian, he always uses it. He's rarely ever seen without it. And that is one of my biggest complaints about this figure in general. He should be able to wear his jetpack and his cloak at the same time. He always wears them together in the show. They've made it in a way where you just can't. I mean, you can, but it looks really dumb. Another choice you have to make is the jetpack or the blaster. You can't have the blaster on his back at the same time as the jetpack either. It's cool that he comes with the jetpack. I really wanted him to come with the jetpack, but having to choose between accessories kind of sucks. There are some third party cloak rope things that you can get on there that kind of fix the issue, but you shouldn't have to go to the third party market to do something that should just be part of the figure in the first place. Now the jetpack, since it's a new accessory, let's talk about it real quick here. It is molded all in one color plastic. There's absolutely no paint apps on it whatsoever. It has a bit of detail molded in there. It fits snugly on his back if that's what you're looking to do. I really haven't had a problem with it falling off, but I do wish it had more paint. Scuff marks, some silvery paint on there to give it some more reflective luster, something more than just the dull gray that it has. So as far as the regular release goes, that's it. That's all it comes with. The backpack, the two blasters, a removable cape. But if you got the target buildup pack, we got a few more things. Firstly, as I've talked about already, you get a removable helmet. There's a Din Djarin face underneath there. The helmet is a second piece that you can lose or you keep on. I'm going to be keeping mine on. On top of the Mandalorian here though, we do get a couple of small accessories I wanna talk about. First, we have these microscopic Beskar ingots. We get five of them. On paper, that's cool. It's an extra thing he comes with. They are molded with a little bit of swirly detail in the plastic, and they do have a molded Imperial insignia on the Beskar, just like it does in the show. The problem here is we just get these. There's no Cam Tono to put them in. There's no way to store them. He can hold them. You can lose them, or you can put them in a bag, keep them in the original package. Honestly, I don't know what to do with these. They're so small, you can barely even see it on camera. I just honestly kind of would rather not have these. It's just something to lose, and I don't feel like I get anything out of having them. If they were little accessories to go in a Cam Tono, that's different, because the real accessory is the Cam Tono, we just get the best car to go inside of it. If you're not aware, Cam Tono is just the ice cream maker that people carry around from time to time in Star Wars. Another tiny accessory that we get on top of the Beskar ingots is the tracking fob. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't think I am. He never really used a tracking fob like this in this armor. Not that I can think of anyway. Maybe in episode four, he used this to find the child initially, but I think once he turned the child in, I don't think he ever used the tracking fob ever again. So it's kind of a cool accessory to have with your season one Mandalorian, but it is kind of a weird thing to come with this figure. Now there is one other major thing that comes with the Mandalorian buildup. We also get a, a newly sculpted child or Grogu or Baby Yoda, whatever you want to call him. We get another one. And this is actually the third one released in 2020. I think the paint and sculpt on this one is worse than on the standalone one, but unlike the standalone one, this one also has no articulation. So I guess, I mean, when I put it like that, I don't really like this one at all. Yoda's head moves all the way around. His hand can swivel this one as well and that's it that's that's it i would have understood had they just put the original grogu in this pack and just bought them together or if they were just going to completely you know improve this i would understand that but i feel like they made it worse it's a really weird weird option now he also does come with his own accessory as well and this is something that the original one should have come with in the first place and that is the pram it's really hard to beat 
an officially made detailed pram. This pram is molded off the one that Quill made at the very end of the first season of The Mandalorian. The top is removable. You really can't do anything with it, so it's either on or you put it aside and hope you don't lose it. The inside has a lot of great molding and detailing. It's got some padding in there. It also has a removable little stand on there, and that's nice as well. I do think that the pram is too small or the Grogu is too big, because you can put them in there, but it just feels like he is a little too big for it. The only way to close it up is if he lays back. Grogu spends a lot of time hanging out at the front of his pram like this, kind of hovering around, and I just don't think that looks very good. But again, I kind of like that he comes with this. The original one should have come with this. It's weird that he didn't. Off the top of my head, I can think of at least three prams that were destroyed. So he's been through quite a few. So hopefully we'll get a whole Baby Yoda collection of prams. And that's it for the accessories. So you have to ask yourself, are those few extra pieces of accessories worth the extra $15 that this figure costs? And I would say, well, it's kind of up to you. For me, the pram's almost kind of worth it by itself. But there are a couple things I wish it came with instead. Number one, alternate hands. I say this all the time, but it remains true. But number two, and this is more serious, flame effects for the jetpack would have been a fantastic addition to this, as well as a flight stand. Hasbro's been doing this flight stand thing recently, and I don't understand why he comes with a jetpack and not a flight stand. Every Mandalorian that comes with the jetpack deserves a flight stand. It's like making a jet without a robe and they would never oh yeah they would it would have helped a lot by putting him into some cool flying poses with one but speaking of poses let's go ahead and take a look at his articulation his head moves all the way around it moves forward this far back this far it has a bit of a waggle there is a double jointed hinge at the base of the neck and the shoulders he has a butterfly joint at his shoulder it moves out this far all the way around. There's a single joint at the elbow that moves up that far, as well as a swivel. He has a swivel at the wrist, as well as a hinge. This wrist hinges this way. He has a torso joint that can be somewhat hindered by the belt. It moves forward this far, back this far. His leg moves out that far, back not very far. He has an upper thigh swivel, a double jointed knee, a hinge at the ankle, and a rocker with this being his widest stance with both his feet flat on the ground. So this is one of those instances where this figure is the exact same as the first release Mandalorian that came out 10 years ago in 2019. He's got some new molded bits for his armor, sure, but the articulation is the exact same. He's got the butterfly joints. He's got decent elbow movement. He's got the older style legs, which I actually kind of wish we got the newer style legs now. He looks and moves great. There's really nothing new to talk about and no complaints. So that just leaves us with the paint, the sculpt, and the detail. So I've already talked about the paint. I don't really want to rag on it too much because that's also part of how he looks. But the paint that we do have, I have to say, is actually really sharp and very nice. It's just a little too dull. This is the shiny, new, practically indestructible Beskar armored Mandalorian who'll run into battle getting shot, deflecting blaster bolts and lightsaber attacks with reckless abandon. And they do a good job with the paint and sculpt to show that off here by not putting any dings or dents or marks on him anywhere. The helmet has essentially the same molded detail that the original one had because as far as I can tell the helmet is the same. But what is different is the chest piece underneath is completely differently molded. It looks fantastic. He has some brand new shoulder pieces and on the right hand shoulder we also have his new emblem, the Mudhorn. I guess it's called a sigil. He earned that in the second episode of the show and they didn't put it on until the very end of the first season. It is a cool little detail and something that I like a lot. It's actually a really cool sigil. He's got the forearm gauntlets molded right on. The one on the left hand side has those like singing, whistling bird things they talk about. I don't really know, but they're basically little missiles that fire out of his gauntlet and kind of roam around the room hitting things at random. He does have new armor on his legs, but his boots again are pretty much the same. We just have some minor paint differences. So the major differences here are his chest, shoulders, and forearms. And that's pretty much it. The rest is the exact same as the original release. So they essentially just took most of that original release, re-sculpted a couple bits, repainted a couple bits, and re-released it 
with some new accessories. It is, I feel, a little lazy, but at the same time, I really can't blame Hasbro because that's kind of what happened in the show too. But I think the biggest thing I want to point out here that I really think they should have done is change his cape. It should have been soft goods. This hard molded cape sure hangs right. It's got a lot of great molded details in the folds and stuff. And those are things you don't get when you get a soft molded cape. But I feel like in this instance specifically, a soft goods cape would have just really been the right choice for this. You could have put his backpack on still. It fits better around the blaster rifle. There's just so many more pros than cons to having a, a soft goods cape here. It really was a mistake to have the molded one. So finally, we come down to want and availability. Is this something I wanted and is it easy to get? I mean, the answer to want is obvious. Of course I did. This is, in my opinion, the Mandalorian that should have come out in the first place. The first one we got, he was only in the show for the first 10 minutes of the first episode like that before he got his first armor upgrade. So he wasn't even accurate to that for a whole episode. He is accurate to this for essentially the entire second season and most of the first season. This is the definitive look for The Mandalorian. Releasing a second version like this is a little bit like having to buy DLC for a video game, but it's like buying DLC that's the same price as the original game. I mean, this costs $20 and it's essentially just a brand new skin unlock. It's mostly the same figure we've gotten before. So while I wanted it, of course. I'm a fan of the show, I'm a fan of the character. It really does drag it down a little bit. Now, if you're looking to find the regular release of this figure, good luck. He's easily the most sought after from this wave. If you didn't pre-order him, he probably is gonna be really hard to find. There are places that are taking orders online and I feel like at this point, that's the best way to get him. Now, now that's for the original release. What about the Target one? Did I want the Target one? And the answer is even yes sir, I guess. I mean, the extra accessories are cool. A different Grogu is nice. The Pram, mwah, finally, we got a, an actual official Pram. On paper, he's great. Removable helmet, awesome. Beskar, cool. But when it comes down to how practical these are, I feel like they were the wrong choices. They could have made a better buildup with better accessories than what they gave us. And I, I don't know who was in charge of this, but I definitely feel like there were more missed opportunities than good things that we got. And then even worse than some of the accessory choices are making this target exclusive. If you're sitting here thinking, yes, I want the pram. Yes, I want the removable helmet. The problem now is that target is your worst enemy. They don't do anything against bots and people ordering all of them online and they sell out in seconds. I actually lucked out on this one and got mine ordered online the moment it went live, but I only got the one, that was it. Once I ordered and my order went through, it was sold out. There are people finding him in stores currently right now. Chances are, if you go to your Target, you might see him. But it's also really hard because scalpers are everywhere, I feel like. And this one is heavily scalped. If you're buying an extra one because you know you can sell it for more online, you can just go fuck yourself. So that brings us to a couple different scores here. And this might surprise you, but uh, for the regular release, I'm gonna give it a 3.75 out of five. It's not the best, but it could be worse. He's essentially the same figure that we got before, but with some tweaks and upgrades that I just wish were a little shinier and maybe a little bit easier to get. The exclusive version, the deluxe version, is a little bit harder. I'm gonna give that one actually a three out of five. He has essentially all the same problems as the regular Beskar Mandalorian, but with some added problems, of being more expensive, coming with weird choices for accessories, and being exclusive, so therefore he's much harder to get. Either way, I really wanted to like these, and in, in a sense I do, but I wanted to like them more so, but I just couldn't get over the mediocrity that I feel like this figure exudes. It's not bad, I would never call it bad. Either of them, I would never call them bad. They're just not great and I wanted them to be great so bad. So if you want to get one despite its lower score I'd probably recommend trying to get the deluxe version. At the very least it comes with the pram and you get the removable helmet and that's kind of cool. If you want to save your money and you just care about having the best guard Mando you could easily pass on the target exclusive version and just get the regular one. Whichever case I don't really recommend getting both unless you're crazy and a completionist like myself. So with that that's all I have. Let me know down the downstairs area 
What do you think of this? Did you get one? Do you like one? Are you watching this to determine which one you want to get? Do you agree with my opinion? I love to read and respond to all the comments down in the downstairs area. I'd also like to take a moment to thank these people here for supporting me on Patreon at a Black Series level or higher. If you want to get your name on here, you can head over to my Patreon and it supports the channel. If that's not your thing, down in the downstairs area are a couple different ways that you can support the channel that are free up to and including liking, sharing, subscribing, and hitting the bell for more notifications. But with that, that's it. Thanks for watching, thanks for getting this far, and I'll see you later. Bye.